From the RSNA, this is the Radiology Artificial Intelligence Podcast. My name is Paul Gee, and I'm a radiologist at the University of Maryland and co-host of the podcast. And my name is Ali Tijani, and I'm a radiology resident at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and co-host of the podcast. Each month, we dive into the hottest topics in radiology AI and talk with leading experts, thought leaders, and movers and shakers in the field. Welcome back to the Radiology AI podcast. On this episode, we're joined by experts for a conversation about the role of AI for opportunistic imaging. Dr. Michael Rosenthal is an assistant professor of radiology at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital, a senior physician at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and a fellow of the Society of Abdominal Radiology. His doctoral work in computer science focused on machine learning techniques for medical image analysis. He completed his MD-PhD work at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, attended radiology residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and completed a fellowship in cancer imaging at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. He focuses his clinical work on the imaging of gastrointestinal cancers, most notably in pancreatic cancer, and his research uses artificial intelligence to improve the early detection of pancreatic cancer. We're also joined by Dr. Kirti Magudia, an assistant professor of radiology at Duke University School of Medicine. Dr. Magudia studied mechanical engineering at UC Berkeley and graduated with an MD and PhD from the Weill Cornell Rockefeller and Sloan Kettering Tri-Institutional MD PhD program. She then went to complete diagnostic radiology residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital, UCSF Department of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging's one-year NIH-funded T32 program, and a one-year clinical fellowship in abdominal imaging and ultrasound at UCSF. She currently serves on faculty at the Abdominal Imaging Division at Duke University and is an early career physician scientist studying the AI applications in medical imaging, including CT-based body composition and prostate MRI. Last but not least, we're joined by a member of the Radiology AI Trainee Editorial Board, Abhinav Suri. Abhinav is a medical student at the David Geffen School of Medicine at the University of California, Los Angeles, and a Medical Research Scholars Program Fellow at the National Institutes of Health. His research focuses on the intersection between artificial intelligence and radiology for opportunistic screening of diseases. He's a member of the Trainee Editorial Board of Radiology AI and has authored a book titled Practical AI for Healthcare Professionals. Now, stick around to hear our panel's thoughts on the current use and future directions for the role of AI for opportunistic imaging. Shine a light on your research by presenting your work at RSNA 2024. We're looking for thought leaders to provide scientific presentations, educational exhibits, and quality improvement reports. Submissions are open February 21st through May 1st, noon central time. Submit your abstract today. Go to rsna.org slash abstracts. Welcome everyone back to the Radiology AI podcast. Boy, do we have a treat today. I wish everyone was here with us, but we're glad you're here virtually because we have a pretty exciting roundtable uh, here with our group to talk about AI for opportunistic imaging. But before we get into the depths of this topic, I'd like to ask our guests, can you tell us just more about who you are, how you know each other? Because it sounds like we have some history here. So let me start with Abhinav one of our trainee editorial board members and guest hosts here. Abhinav, tell us who you are and and how you got into this topic. So hi, everyone. My name is Abhinav. I just go by Abhi. And uh, basically, uh, in terms of just how I ended up in this field, I did my undergraduate at University of Pennsylvania in computer science and biology. And uh, in my post-bac year, right before I was applying for medical school, I uh, sort of got into opportunistic screening for vertebral deformities and published a paper on how you could use opportunistic screening on extant imaging and MR, CT, and X-ray to look for vertebral deformities on all those imaging modalities. And then since then, I'm at a medical school at UCLA, and I've taken a research here. I'm at the NIH right now, and uh, we're doing opportunistic screening for diabetes prediction in Dr. Ronald Summer's lab. Um, as far as like how I actually know everyone, um, so. I know Kirti through uh, basically the Radiology AI Trainee Editorial Board, uh, met at RSNA as well. Um, and then also I uh, hosted one of the tweet chats on uh, opportunistic screening as well. Um, and then of course I know Ali and Paul just uh, from interacting with y'all over email and then also meeting up at RSNA as well. I haven't met Dr. Rosenthal yet, but uh, based on his bio, I'm really excited to hear what he has to say. 
Yeah, and just a shout out to uh, Ali and myself. Um, I'm an alum of the inaugural TEV along with Kirti, and Ali is a current member. So uh, it's great to make connections even on the podcast. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm Kirti Magudia. I'm an abdominal imager in my third year of practice at Duke um, University. Um, I did residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital where I worked with Michael um, Rosenthal, who was my mentor and introduced me to this entire field when I was a third year radiology resident and who I've been working with since. And I really can't thank him enough for his support and guidance as an early career physician scientist. Um, and I also had the pleasure of sitting next to Abby at the Radiology AI editorial board meeting and was really impressed to hear that he was working with, with Ron Summers. Um, so looking forward to hearing his perspectives, uh, another giant in this field of opportunistic screening of medical imaging using AI. And of course, um, Ali and I work together on the RSNA Imaging AI and Practice Demonstration Project and have really appreciated um, his perspectives in this field and um, enjoy interacting with Paul as we're both early career radiologists working on AI. Fantastic. Well, I'm Michael Rosenthal. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us and uh, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I started off as a computer scientist like uh, Abby and uh, went into medicine after undergrad. Uh, I did a joint MD-PhD uh, at UNC Chapel Hill and came to pursue radiology and try to find a way to unify radiology uh, in the clinical domain with my computer science research interests. And as it turns out, I got attached to a, a big group at Dana-Farber that's doing early detection work in pancreatic cancer. And the process of building tools to do that, I kind of had to do opportunistic screening because if you're screening for pancreatic cancer, you find a lot of other things. Uh, so I'm really excited to see how this world has absolutely exploded in the last three years and it just gets faster and faster. So I'm, I'm looking forward to talking about that today. Wonderful. Thank you all for being here. And gosh, that, that last comment really kind of hits home. Last three years, it's such a short time frame, but I agree. You know, when I first heard about opportunistic imaging, I wasn't too familiar with the, the field and the topic. And, you know, we, we heard about this group out in Wisconsin looking at using Hounsford units on CT abdomen pelvises. We already have all this data, right? And trying to determine is a patient at risk for osteopenia osteoporosis. And it blew my mind that we could do that. But let's just start with what is opportunistic imaging and what are some of the more common use cases that you've seen? Kirti, let's, let's start with you. What do you think? Thanks, Ali. Um, opportunistic screening or opportunistic imaging uh, is generally defined as screening that depends on requests um, from patients or their providers or when they're providing for care for some other indication. So an example of this would be, you know, outside of the domain of radiology would be when a child undergoes vision screening while um, visiting their pediatrician. So they're already there. They're going to check and make sure that they have good vision. With organized screening, that would be coordinated by the public sector. So for that same child, it would be when they're already in school. So we're kind of catching them and, you know, hopefully all children will be covered by that vision screening test. And when it comes to opportunistic screening in radiology, um, there's a couple different categories I like to think about. The first is biomarker development. And that is um, where something near and dear to me, which is body composition, would kind of fall into that. We're thinking about creating biomarkers from imaging and harnessing latent value from the imaging that's already being performed, but not being reflected in our radiology reports. Other ideas would be coronary calcium scores, um, hepatic attenuation, so looking to see if you can detect fat um, in the liver. Um, and then this other major category would be identification of incidental findings, um, such as you're already doing a CT, let's make sure we're catching abdominal aortic aneurysms, pulmonary emboli that are maybe in the lung bases if you're looking at abdominal CT, things like that. So um, that's all really exciting. And I agree with Ali. I remember uh, just being astounded that we could use Hounsview units, something just so simple to figure out, is this patient at risk for osteoporosis or osteopenia? But moving to something a little bit more advanced with AI, what's the role of AI in opportunistic imaging? Obviously, there's tons and tons of data. And I think one of the things that I'm hearing is we can glean a lot more information, a lot more value from the images than what we might have originally intended or the narrow clinical question at hand. So how do you see AI playing a role in opportunistic imaging? And what do you think are the most exciting examples to your recent memory of this? Uh, so I, I think that it's such an extraordinary time in terms of the development of AI tools, making these capabilities viable. So back in about 2017, I started into a project in pancreatic cancer where I had to manually label all of the muscle and fat on CT scans that had happened 
um, before the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. And it was really time consuming. Uh, it took me about two years to label a thousand scans myself. And I realized, okay, th this is interesting from a research project, but you're never going to be able to use this at scale because radiologists aren't going to spend hours a day doing this. And that's when we built our platform for doing automated analysis of body composition. Um, and so the goal of that was not just to do the thing that we were doing in research, but to do it in a completely automated way so that we could scale it to populations. And so we built a system that could automatically identify the level of the CT scan we needed to analyze as per the gold standard, and then do that analysis as well as humans. And in, in fact, we did that, Kirti and I um, did that together, and we published a population reference set in radiology showing that, in fact, yeah, you can analyze tens of thousands of scans, and you can now generate um, distributions that describe populations and say where an individual lies within this population. And for me, that was transformational in my thinking about this because it meant that now I could actually run this on a million CT scans. I could run this on every CT scan that is done in my entire enterprise every day and have this result, and it could be actionable. And it's something that a radiologist never talks about. Like, how much muscle does the person have? I've never put that into a report. I've never seen that in a report. But as it turns out, there's an enormous body of literature saying that, in fact, how much muscle you have and maybe how much muscle you have relative to your peers matters for your overall survival. It matters for your ICU stays. It matters for your recovery from surgery. It matters for your chemotherapy tolerance. Um, and in a paper we published last year, it actually predicts the development of pancreatic cancer, um, even when we don't have other markers of it. So this kind of automation driven by AI systems that couldn't have existed five years ago is absolutely making opportunistic screening something that is, uh, is not only viable, but is absolutely uh, running onto the stage, waving its hand saying, hey, I'm a new thing in radiology uh, and I'm gonna be transformational for patient care. Yeah, I, I think that's super interesting, Michael, just this idea of automation. Uh, I come from an orthopedic background and musculoskeletal imaging background, and I've seen for years papers looking at things like the psoas index, something as simple as measuring what's the cross-sectional area of the psoas muscle at like the L3 level. But even that, right, you ask you or me to do this on call, we're not going to do it just because we've got so many other things to do. But then we're talking about even more advanced things like volumes of maybe visceral fat versus subcutaneous, et cetera. But beyond automation, I'm curious uh, for Kirti, Abi, or Michael, is there a role beyond that, maybe for gleaning information beyond what we already know? Because I think one of the things um, is that we know that we can measure these things. We know that we can correlate them. But what do you think about finding features um, beyond our human vision, You know, whether it's radiomics or some other deep feature kind of extraction? Just curious what you guys think about that. Yeah, this is like very much what I'm working on this year, essentially. So whenever we look at diabetes, like effectively, like one of the areas that we're really interested in is looking at the pancreas. Um, so of course, um, our labs already published like, oh, you can look at things like fatty infiltration of the pancreas, the volume of the pancreas and things like that. But are there hidden features out there that are sort of like these higher order features um, that could be a little bit more predictive of diabetes in a person? Um, and really, that's where deep learning can also take another step in. Uh, so doing things like analyzing the volume at large, uh, taking, as you mentioned, radiomics features, which, uh, you know, they may not correlate perfectly clinically to like, oh, this is like best uh, reflective of the amount of fat or something like that in the pancreas, but still are predictive features. I think that deep learning really has a role in helping us extract uh, a larger number of features that are more predictive and ultimately would lead to a better classification accuracy. At least that's what I'm seeing in my work right now. Um, and then I'll also say uh, that, uh, you know, advances in the field of AI have really benefited this field of opportunistic screen as well, like specifically with uh, tools such as NNUNet and uh, Total Segmentator. Uh, we can go beyond uh, looking at like a single organ. We can now look at, oh, how about instead of just looking at the pancreas, we could also take a look at the liver and the spleen and then also look at like the bones, et cetera. And really, whenever you're dealing with so many different organs and so many different features, deep learning has a role in uh, feature extraction and helping us figure out like which ones are actually most important um, and most predictive. So overall, I think that, you know, deep learning has uh, many different ways that it can help out in the field of opportunistic screening. 
Yeah, and I just want to add that, you know, thinking about achievable problems or things that we know we can do, we can measure something, we can, you know, find the attenuation or the volume or the area of something, you know, those are achievable problems. And this is not the same as AI that's trying to do something like predicting pathology or genetic mutations from imaging, which is really difficult. And in some ways, you know, is it challenging? How are we you know, going to get to the point where that is going to change clinical practice? There's a lot of steps that needs to happen. But with these more achievable AI applications, you know, this is something that could really change the way we practice radiology in next year or the year after that. And I think that's exciting. You, you know, it, I think that's, that's so interesting. And I think one of the powers here is um, being able to place these findings, these, you know, as, as I think Paul was mentioning, this, these complex tasks that we may not have time for on a daily basis, but placing them not just in the in context of objective findings, but also relative to these registries of population data, right? If I'm on call, I may notice on an on a MRI of the brain that there's volume loss with a certain pattern, but I may not know how that fits with regards to the patient's demographics, but being able to a automatically seg you know automate the segmentation of of that volume and then b to place it in context of other patients with similar demographic characteristics and just have that presented to me right while i'm already looking for other ta other more complex tasks maybe it's just such a powerful tool and i think that there's a real potential to translate that to to patient outcomes now so i think it's a, this is all a very exciting field and you know paul and i we always want to learn about the research that our our guests are working on i know we've all mentioned a little bit about it let me ask you this question why don't you tell us more about some of the exciting use cases that you're working on? But if you could tell us, I think we may have some shared experiences in terms of some challenges, right? Our listeners, I can always tell, enjoy hearing about how we overcome these challenges because I'm sure that we, we may be facing it as we're listening to this podcast right now. So what do you think? So tell us about your research and some challenges and how we can address those or how you've addressed those successfully. I'm happy to, to lead off um, if you'd like. So you know, I'm very focused on the early detection of pancreatic cancer. And so we've been working on a couple of different um, fronts in the imaging domain. Uh, the primary one is body composition analysis, where we're looking at muscle and fat. And we've used AI to be able to, as I mentioned, uh, do this in an automated way across large numbers of patients. We found that uh, muscle wasting uh, happens in pe people who are going on to develop pancreatic cancer um, at least 18 months before the, the clinical diagnosis. And this lines up with work that other groups have been doing. For example, the Mayo Group and Klein crew have done fantastic work using radiomic analysis um, of the pancreas and have also found that radiomic changes are happening at least three to six months before um, the clinical diagnosis and potentially even longer than that. They had a, a median uh, time of 475 days, I think, before uh, diagnosis in that cohort. So these are, um, these are tools that we're in the uh, retrospective analysis phase of biomarker development, but we're now moving them forward. The next step here is prospective uh, analysis, and that's what I am uh, up to my neck in right now. And it, it's an exciting time. We now have a prospective screening study that's open um, at Dana-Farber that's accruing high-risk individuals, uh, people at high risk for pancreatic cancer based on familial risk or established genetic risk. The, the backbone of this is the CAPS um, protocol where we do annual MRI and endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, we're also doing some novel blood tests with return of results there that actually change results. But one of the key components of this for my group is that we're also performing all of these AI tests in the background. We're not returning results yet, but we are prospectively analyzing now. And if we see that these AI tools, the body composition work, we also have work in ICD code analysis and um, in natural language processing, if any of these AI-based risk signals correspond to people who actually go on to develop pancreatic cancer, we will publish and we convert that into actually a return of results study where we're taking action on human beings based on these AI signals. Uh, and that's the kind of forward progress that I'm most excited about because that's the thing that's going to change practice and actually change lives for our patients. That's so interesting. And I think that there are so many applications to a lot of these different imaging biomarkers that we're generating with opportunistic imaging. 
Um, I'm looking at some other applications of body composition based on some of that work that we did earlier together. Just a shout out to RSNA for funding me for a research scholar award. And as part of that, I'm looking at how body composition data using AI analysis of abdominal CT in and out and retrospective analyses can help more optimally select patients for bariatric surgery, which is one of the surgical treatments that we have for obesity in this country, which is increasing in prevalence um, in the United States over time. And so what we're doing here is we're looking retrospectively at patients who had bariatric surgery, seeing which proportion of those patients had abdominal CT and calculating their body composition data from that. And then seeing how that's associated with either short-term risks from surgery and their long-term outcomes from surgery. Because you know this is a pretty major surgery that people are going through. So if we can somehow give them more specific data on body composition, it really may help make sure that we reduce the number of patients undergoing surgery who, let's say, have less muscle mass and might be at more risk for worse outcomes right around the time of surgery. Or there may be certain um, body composition profiles that might predict which patients, for example, will have more optimal weight loss after surgery. And maybe we can shuttle those patients towards that treatment option. Right now, the way that the bariatric surgery community is looking at this is weight BMI, which is just weight divided by height squared. And then um, generally people are using bioimpedance, um, which is more imprecise and will give them a measure of fat mass and fat free mass. But we can actually give them much more information than that from CT. So they're quite excited to work with us on this project. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Radiology AI podcast. Check out the journal Radiology Artificial Intelligence for more original research about opportunities in imaging and other use cases. Subscribe now for the Radiology AI podcast for more discussion on content from the journal and hot topics in our field. We hope that you've enjoyed this episode of the Radiology Artificial Intelligence podcast. Shout out to Yuri Shemchison for our podcast music and to the RSNA podcast staff. Email us at podcasts at rsna.org anytime with questions, feedback, or suggestions. Thank you.